We will not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God and salvation. Listen, we're going to have a little bit different night. I'm not going to be preaching at you. I'm going to try not to preach. It's hard for a preacher not to preach, okay? Um, so, you know, the spitting's going to be down to a minimum and all that good stuff. Um, but listen, I'm going, to, I'm going to have a question and answer. So if you have a question uh, during tonight's uh, uh, time, please feel free to just raise your hand. Now, I'll acknowledge you, and I may have to, you may have to wait for me to get to a place to stop, and then we'll go back to that question, but I won't make you wait that long. Amen? So uh, listen, we, I, I shared just a few minutes ago, and I'm really kind of wondering if maybe next year that's what we're going to do since we have Thursdays and Fridays. Maybe the Thursday before we have a night of communion, just like he did, you know, like last supper. Maybe even have a meal where we come together on that Thursday and have a meal that day with bread. And with grape juice, before anybody starts wondering. You know, just have a meal together. Come together and have a meal. And I'm not talking about a big old potluck. I'm talking about something simple where we have communion together, where we pass around bread and we, we break it and we do those things. Amen? And then on Friday, we could talk about what we're talking tonight. Because what I'm doing tonight is I'm going to give you a, a quote-unquote medical account of the crucifixion. I, I want to talk to you at, through the eyes of Luke. Now, how many of you know that the apostle Luke was a physician? Okay, he was a doctor. So he looked at things differently. In fact, what you have is you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're called the synoptic gospels. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you've read your Bible, you'll realize that they're very similar in their accounts. But in some cases, one will mention something that the other does not. Uh, example would be where uh, Luke will mention things that are more on the physical aspect. Um, they represent uh, the king, the servant, the man. They represent all these facets of God. Just like if I sit here and, and Brother Ray, let's say me and Brother Ray have the exact same vision. God may give us the same vision, but our description of it is two different ways. Because Brother Ray is his own man and I'm my own man. And so we, we describe it based on, you know, you've had your background. You've had the military background. You've had all these things. I've not been in the military. So God may show you, and you're more on the military side, the ordered side, and I may be more the civvy side, the civilian side. Does it make sense? So that's what happens when you have the four Gospels. That's why there's four of them. They represent different aspects of the king, okay? And the best way to put it is the way I always put it. Imagine God is a giant diamond, okay? A giant diamond. And if you look at a diamond when it's been cut, it has all these flat surfaces. They call them facets. And if you look at the facet, it reflects the light when it's a certain way. But if you turn the diamond, it's another facet that reflects the light. And if it's a pure diamond, like God would be, it is brilliant. And you couldn't, it's like, wow, look at that diamond with the right light. God cannot show himself to us and us not die. That's what his word says. So he reveals himself different facets at a time depending on where your walk is. That's why Mark, Luke, and John are so important. Some say, well, I like John better than I like Mark. And I, I like Luke better than I like. Well, that's because that's your personality. But I will say, if you want to grow to become more like Christ, you'll learn to like all four. Because they all represent him equally. Amen. So listen, um, hangings, electrocutions, gas chambers, they all still happen today. And, and quite honestly, we shudder when we think of the pain. You think about, okay, they still hang people? Absolutely. They electrocute people. Uh, Jonathan and I were talking about that not too long ago. Uh, they were talking about that uh, legally a person has not gone through the, elect uh, the uh, process of being electrocuted until they are dead. Because that's what electrocution means. And you look at these things and you look at uh, the gas chamber and you think about, wow, you know, you think about how the Nazis did that to the Jews in, in, in just, you know, huge amounts. But the truth is, what you're going to find out tonight, they all fail in comparison to what Jesus went through. Because I want to talk to you about that. No one's crucified today. Nobody goes through crucifixions today. I, I was trying to research any modern day crucifixions. I couldn't find any outside of cru Christians being persecuted. But there's no government or there's no organization that goes around crucifying people the way they used to. 
Now the cross uh, remains confined to ornaments and jewelry and stained glass windows and romanticized pictures and romanticized statues and everything's portraying this serene death. And as a matter of fact, one of the things I always tell people is he wasn't crucified with a loincloth in a perfect placement. He hung naked on the tree. So we have these serene pictures. We have these crucifix and people say, oh, look how beautiful it is. Because the truth is, is that if you had actually represented Christ properly in the pictures and in the statues, you wouldn't recognize that it was a man hanging on the cross. You would have a hard time understanding that it was a man. He was so deformed at the end. Physically deformed, not just spiritually with a, with a sin of the world on him. He was so deformed from what he went through, you would have a hard time recognizing that it was a man, except for maybe the hands and the feet, which were nailed to the cross. The crucifixion was a form of execution that was refined by the Romans, and it was a precise art. It was created to produce one a slow death. It wasn't a guillotine. It was meant to be slow. It was meant to bring maximum pain. It was meant to be a public spectacle so they could deter other criminals from breaking the law. And it was meant to be feared. That's what it was about. It was something that was public. So I want to take you to the Garden of Gethsemane now. Luke twenty two forty four 44 says this. And being in an agony... He prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, how many of you have been out working in the sun before and you've sweated profusely? Okay, just about everybody, whether it be for athletes or, or going and doing something around a house or the garden, you've sweated profusely. But have you ever sweated to where the sweat was dripping off your body? Most of you would not. Most of you, the, the sweat would drip this way. What, would hap what was happening to Jesus, he was in such intense stress that what was actually happening was that he was sweating past what the medical term profusely, and he was sweating with great drops of sweat. In other words, it would be as if somebody got this water and poured it over my head. And after the initial pour off of the water, drops were coming off. This is how much was going through him. This is how much stress he was going through. Now, here's the interesting thing. What happens is when we go through that, there's dehydration. There's exhaustion, okay? And some argue that it wasn't actual drops of blood based on Luke 22, but the question I have, if it wasn't actual drops of blood, this is what made me research it. Why didn't they say, and it was like drops of wine? Or it was like drops of water? Why did they use as drops of blood? So what I did is I did some research, and in the research, there's a thing called, forgive me, hema, hematodrosis. There's 76 documented cases of this over the past written history. And what this is, is a situation where there's such intense uh, emotional stress going on that not only is there great drops of sweat coming out of the person, but the capillaries within the sweat glands, they burst. And so at the very least, you have the pigment of the blood or you have the color, which is what pigment, you have the color of the blood mixing with the sweat so it could easily be determined as great drops of blood. When I look at the Greek on Matthew 22, put that back up, Raj. It says, was as it were. When I looked at the Greek, what it actually means is just like. It doesn't mean looks like. It means just like. It's a direct correlation. So I'll be honest with you. I simply believe under this condition of emotional distress, I believe that it was actual blood. I believe he had an awareness of what was about to come upon him. The highness nature of sin was about to come upon him. He who knew no sin was about to become sin. He knew sin's destructive and deadly effects. 
He understood the sorrow and the conflict that it brings and the heartache that it inflicts. And it, he understood also that there must be an extreme measure done in order to deal with it. That all the sin, all the sin of the world, from Genesis all the way to Revelation after his death, was going to be placed upon him. Every sin that man, ha, ha, woman has ever committed was going to be placed upon him. It said he that knew no sin was about to be made sin. Every sin that you've ever committed, that I've ever committed, the ones done in secret, the ones done in public, the ones done of ignorance that, oh, we don't like to hold ourselves accountable because we were ignorant. We didn't know he had to pay the price for that as well. And he understood that all the sin of the world was about to be upon him and that the wrath of Father was going to go after the sin. Beloved, this is where he was. See, I'll be honest with you. Lots of people like to talk about the beatings, the first abuse that he got. But the first physical thing that Jesus went through was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because he was stressing so much that he was actually sweating drops of sweat laden with blood. For he knew what was about to happen. He said, Father, if it is possible, take this cup from me. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He knew what was about to happen. He, he, he understood what many of us don't understand. Many of us will come into church and we immediately, oh, his grace, his grace, his grace. We love his grace. But we take no account of the times where we do the things that we do. Romans says that where sin abounds, grace abounds more abundantly. Somebody say Amen. But it also says, it also says, so let's not sin more so that more grace will abound. For every time we sin by choice, we nail him back to the cross. We put him back there while we enjoy our sin. So he's taken. He's taken from the garden. They ask. And one of the favorite, my favorite scriptures, I don't have it memorized right now, but it's in John. When John talks about this, and none of the other scriptures talk about this, but this is really, really cool. I just, I love this, so I'm just going to share it. It's not in my notes. In the book of John, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, they say, are you Jesus? And he says, I am he. And when he says, I am he, the Bible says that all the soldiers and all of them just fell out on their backsides. That the power of God just hit and they just poof. Because he said, I am he. You know, he could have stopped it at any time, guys. He could have stopped it. He knew what was, he knew already what was happening, what was about to happen. He said, take it from me, Father. He could have stopped it. All he had to say was, I am he. And he stopped all those soldiers. They fell down is what it says. They fell down in the spirit. It was the first example of being slain in the spirit. Come on. Boom. And that's, that's his enemies. They don't, not, not his loved ones. Fell down in the spirit. Peter, you all know the story, grabs a sword, cuts the ear off. He's going to fight. Jesus says, what are you doing? Heals the soldier that's going to take him to this place. He could have stopped it at any time. So they take him to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate takes him to Herod. Herod takes him back to Pontius Pilate. All these things are going on. But let me tell you what happens. Uh, you know, imagine this. They put a blindfold on him. And then they start to beat him. And as they beat him, they're laughing at him saying, prophesy to me who hit you. You know, let me tell you something. Jesus could have told them the name of their mother, their father, their grandparents, the name of their pet dog when they were 10 years old. But they mocked him and they hit him. Now, there's something in fighting that I want to share something with you so that you understand what's going on. When you're fighting boxers or, or, or MMA or whatever it is, when you're fighting, when somebody takes a swipe at you, it's called rolling with the punches. When they hit you, you roll with the punches to slow down 
the impact, okay? You block, you, you, you know, the old bob and weave, you avoid. But he was blindfolded. Jesus didn't know where the hit was coming from. He didn't know if it was coming across his temple, his nose, his face, on top of his head, behind his head. So by the time it comes, he was taking on the full brunt of that hit. You can't roll with the punches with a punch you don't see. Why is that important? Why is that important? Because when they took that blindfold off, when they took that cover off his head, already the deformity was beginning. The swelling was beginning. And instead of having pity, they took it to another level. Beloved, picture this in your heads. Picture this in your hearts. A man that never hurt a fly, a man that possibly even healed some of those men's families, was a cover was put over his head and they beat on him. And all he could do was take the brunt of it. Luke 22, 63 and 64. It says, and the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him, meaning hit him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, prophesy, who is it that smote thee? Beloved, I'm not making it up. This is what scripture says. False accusations were coming from everywhere. There was no one to defend him. He didn't even defend himself. Consider this. Peter, the one who drew the sword, and then Jesus healed the ear, also went and denied him three times. There was nobody there to say, stop beating on him. Stop hurting him. There was nobody there. They, the other thing I have to say, that not in my notes, that I know for a fact, the trials that they did was in the middle of the night, which was against Jewish law. They had trials for him in the middle of the night with Ananias, with the different, different leaders. And it was against Jewish law to do so, but they did it. Then they paid people to come and testify against him falsely. And there was nobody, not even his disciples were there to, to say, no, 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 that's not what happened. He was all by himself. All through the night, they took him back and forth. He actually went through seven trials in that one night, folks. Seven times he walked, sometimes miles, to the next place. Well, they went through the night making false accusations. He's tired. He's beaten. He's dehydrated. He's already swelling up in the face. And now, after being abandoned by his disciples... Now we get to the flogging. After going through a night of being beaten and falsely accused and nobody speaking up for him, being, knowing that he was betrayed by one of his own, now we get to the flogging. I mean, for 12 hours previously, this is the morning, it, there was emotional trauma in the garden. There was rejection by his closest friends. There was cruel beating. There was a sleepless night in which he walked countless miles back and forth because you, I guarantee you they didn't give him a horse or a donkey to ride on. There's no way he's prepared for the punishment of the flogging. A man to be flogged was to be stripped completely of his clothes. His hands were to be tied above his head to the post. Above his head so that the arms could not block any part of his body. The soldier would stand behind and to the side of him so as to not to have the flog miss him and come on himself. And what happened was the, the shoulders, the back, the buttocks, the thighs, the legs, all that was to be ripped, was to be flogged. The whip is called a flagellum. It was designed to make devastating punishment 
It has several short, heavy leather strips. And depending on who you talk to in the historical time, there was balls of lead and iron. There was bone. There was glass attached near the end of it. Now, here's the interesting thing. Even the Romans believed that 40 lashes, that the 40th lash was a death stroke. In other words, so many people had died when they had gotten the 40th lash that they called it the death stroke. So what they did is they gave him 39. They gave him 39. And the interesting thing is, as the scourging proceeds, what happens is you've got the balls and you have the leather. It actually is just kind of slightly cutting him, but it's bruising him. It's softening up his skin. And as they continue to whip him, what happens is the skin starts to split. So many times when I did my research, I thought that it was the glass that would get in and rip out. That happened too. But what was happening is that the skin was being, you know, like we get a steak and we beat it to what? Tenderize it? What was happening was they were beating him with this and the skin started to split with the impact. And then it went below the skin to the muscle. And then the muscle started to split with the impact. And to make sure they did a good job, they flipped him over to make sure they got his front side as well. As a matter of fact, if you look and you do your research, you'll see that something about that time that Jesus was flogged, it was worse than other flogs. I, we know spiritually we know that it was demonic. We know that something demonic was going on as he was being whipped. But folks, we talk about the tattered skin. It wasn't tattered skin. It was tattered skin and tattered muscle. There were parts of bone that could be seen on the ribs. This is what your God did for you. This is what he went through. This is what he went through for me. It wasn't one or two. It was 39 lashes with between 9 to 12 pieces of leather. 9 to 12 pieces of bone or iron or lead tied to the ends. This is where the scripture says, by the stripes upon his back, you are healed. Because this is what he went through. This is what he went through for you. For your family. For your enemy. When the beating's finished, the back is in ribbons. And the entire area is torn and it's bleeding and it's, it, the, the blood's coagulating and it's pouring out. And after the 39 lash, because he was still alive, then we get the mocking part. Because what the soldiers did is that the Bible says that they made him stand and they got a purple robe and they wrapped him in it. You ever had a gash in your arm and you put a, a pad over it? What happens? It sucks up the blood, doesn't it? And then the gash sucks up the, the, the pad, doesn't it? So he's just been ripped to shreds, and they put this purple robe on him, and it's just attaching itself to his body, being sucked into the open wounds. They grabbed a, a, a twisted, uh, I, I bless whoever brought this tonight, they grab this, this twisted thorns and they make a haphazard crown out of it and, and then they, they carefully put it on his head. I say carefully? Yeah, they carefully put it on his head because they didn't want to hurt their hands while they were putting it on his head. 
Because the next guy was making a scepter out of a stick, out of a reed, the Bible says. And what they did is they grabbed this, this, this thing and put it on his head. They got the reed and they slammed it upon the top of the crown. Driving the thorns into the skin. Into the head. When I was doing my research on this and looking at it, they were talking about, you see how thin that they are? They're, they're not just hard, but they're kind of flexible, the, the thorns. They were saying that what happened was they went as deep as they could with the skull, and then they would flex and go deeper and follow the skull line, literally separating the meat from the bone. And they called it the crown of thorns. And they, they worshipped him in jest. They spit on him. They struck him on the head with a wooden staff. But more terrible than that is that he wasn't allowed to wear the robe to go to the next stop, the crucifixion. So remember how the pad would get sucked into the wounds? The guards went and grabbed the robe and they ripped it from his body, reopening all the wounds again, leaving the thorns, dropping the reed, and causing him to hemorrhage all over again. I don't know about you, but it could be nothing, nothing but the love of God that kept him alive. Because most people would have given up at that point. He knew he had to do something. So we come to the crucifixion now. Now I know what you see in the movies. The guy picks up the whole cross and he can't hardly carry it. But that's not what happened. The cross is too heavy for one human being. As, even if they wasn't flogged, even if he wasn't beaten, the cross would be too heavy for one man to carry. So what they did is they gave you the cross beam. The vertical beam was permanently at Golgotha. Okay? Permanently there. Outside the city. What they did was they gave those that were going to die with a cross, a cross beam. 75 to 125 pounds. Okay, 75 to 125 pounds, and he's got to carry it outside the city. Even if somebody was perfectly healthy, carrying 75 to 125 pounds on your shoulders. There's no pad. There's wood being stuck in your flesh. He's already been beaten. He's already been scourged. He's bleeding, he's exhausted, he's dehydrated, he's lost blood and water and all these things. And then what happens? Everyone knows the story. He can't make it. He can't carry that cross beam. So Simon was gathered to carry it for him. So Simon carries it. And I'm reminded of the scripture that says that in the middle of this, while women were weeping, he said, stop weeping for, you, for me. Weep for yourselves because of what's going to happen. He was talking about 70 AD where Rome cuts off Jerusalem, cuts off the water, cuts off the food, and literally the Jews are eating their own children. That's what he was talking about because they were starving. It was for years. Jesus is offered wine and myrrh, but he refuses it because it'll deaden the pain. Now on the cross, when he finally gets there, before they hang him up, they lay the cross beam down and they lay him on the cross. Now, I see a lot of crucifixions where, where it's like, you know, it's, it's kind of like this and he's crucified like this and his head's hanging. That's not what the way they did it. What they did was they made sure that the elbows were bent when they were nailing the nails. Now, the nails were six inches long and about three-eighths thick. So that's almost a half-inch thick, uh, about the size of my thumb in thickness, six inches long. And where the nail was put, it wasn't put in the hand because that would not support his weight. It was actually put right here. Okay. Now, I want you to do something. I want you to get your finger, 
and I want you to press it right in the middle of your other wrist. I want you to press it really hard. See, if you do it right, you can actually feel something in your elbow. You feel it? And if you do it really hard and you start to stretch your hand out, you can feel it all through your hands. There's a nerve center right here. This is the nerve center in which you feel on your fingertips. It's a nerve center that goes all the way up your arms and all the way up to your, to your chest. Remember I said the Romans had perfected this. They had tried the hands. They had tried the arms. They picked this place for a reason. One, it was strong enough to hold him up. Any weight of any man, no matter how big the guy was, it's strong enough to hold him right there. And secondly, there's a nerve center there. And thirdly, there's not a lot of blood vessels there. So they're not going to bleed out. So with a cross beam, they lay him down. They don't stretch out his arms. I know in the, in the Passion of Christ, they show where they pull him and stretch him out. And that's not what they did. They actually bent his arms. And I'll explain why in a second. Then, without anything on his feet, they picked him up and hoisted him on and put him on the, on the actual vertical bar. So now he's hanging just by his, his uh, wrist. Then what they do is they get his feet and they pick him up and bend him. And they put one foot on top of the other, and then they run the same spike through both feet with his legs bent. There's a reason for that, too. By the way, if I had you go down and press on your foot, you'd get the same sensation you get on your wrist. It's a nerve center. So here is a, a person being crucified. There's severe nerve damage. There's pain that's caused. But most important is that neither wound causes substantial bleeding. No major arteries are ruptured. They don't want him to bleed out. Now the real horror of the crucifixion happens. I told you that they kept the hands bent. Why is that? Because they wanted the hands above the head when he was hanging. Because it makes it harder to breathe. And then the feet were bent. Why? Because then he would have to push against that nerve center to raise himself up to breathe. And then when his feet were in such pain, he would release and the pain would go to his wrist. And this is what the crucifixion was made for. Up and down. Up and down. For hours. Taking the choice of taking the pain on the arms or on the feet just to get another breath. This is how crucifixion was meant to kill. It wasn't meant to kill through blood, letting out the blood. It wasn't meant to kill in any other way. It was by suffocating you, slowly. See, what would happen is, during this process, well, obviously, you're getting dehydrated. Obviously, you're going to get muscle cramps while you're trying to push I mean, try to stand on one toe, guys. You couldn't. Now try to stand with a nail through both feet on that one spot. Try to hang with a nail in your wrist. He's going up and down. Let's talk about his tattered back for a minute. You know, the Lord showed me this. You think they sanded down the wood so that it was smooth for him? There were, there were splinters and, and roughness on that wood, and his skin's already tattered and ripped apart. It's just catching him every time he's going up and down. It's catching the flesh and ripping it. And, and I mean, I, God was showing me this. Just, and, and then the swelling. And this is all in the physical. Because then what happens, the Bible says, is that the whole sin of the world was placed upon him. You know, your sin of greed, your sin of lust, your sin of unforgiveness, it was placed on him on top of that. So much sin, in fact, Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We don't understand that. We're like, 
uh, what does that mean? That he didn't want to do this? Or it was because the Bible says that father turned his face. He could not see his son put up with what we were putting up with. Beloved, this is the truth. This is the word of God. Jesus suffered in this manner for several hours, is what the Bible says, before a final cry, and then he died. It's Luke 23, 46. It says this, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said that, he gave up the ghost. We could go down the list of all the factors of what he really died from. But I know this, he didn't die from the cross alone. I know that for a fact. I believe he died from heart failure. I believe his heart finally gave out. Why do I say that? Because it was abrupt when he died. See, take into consideration what scripture says. It says that the Roman soldiers, because Passover was coming, they didn't want guys hanging on the thing. They didn't want them to be dying. They wanted them dead already. So the soldiers went around breaking the legs of the other two guys that were crucified. Now, the other two guys didn't go through the flogging, didn't go through all the things Jesus went through. So they were stronger. They broke the legs of the guys that were hanging on both sides of them. So why did they do that? Because if they can't push up with their legs to breathe, they'll suffocate and die. With Jesus, they were going to break the legs. They said, no, I think he's dead. But the Bible says that they went and punctured him with a spear. And then out of that flowed water and blood. Now, because of the way the human anatomy is made up, we know that the spear came in on the right side because there's a sac on the outside of the heart that's more prominent on the right side of the heart. And that sac has a water-type serum in it that when you pierce it, it would come out and it would look like water. And once that, that spear pierced the heart, then the blood would follow. So they made sure he was dead, but he was already dead. And because he died so abruptly, many scholars and theologians believe he died because his heart finally gave out. You know, I'm reminded of like a a horse, a thoroughbred. You know, back in the day, they would ride the horses and they would ride them until they died. When they had to, the horse's heart would just give out because it was constantly pushing pushing and pushing something was pushing your savior and mine folks that something was you something kept him going something kept him going until his heart his physical heart gave out that something was you Nothing else. You and me. That's what happened. He gave until he could give no more. Let me finish with my understanding of what happened. I find numerous examples of Christians that have died for their faith in the past. I look at Fox's Book of Martyrs. I look at other sources, and some of them laughed while they were being led. Some of them sang glory to God while they were being led to their death. Some of them ran to their execution and said, let's get this over with. And they were so brave. And and the question is, why not Jesus? I mean, Jesus was sweating these these tears of blood. I mean, this, this sweat of blood was coming. Why wasn't Jesus... More, He's a victorious champion. He's a lion of the tribe of Judah. Why wasn't Jesus as brave as these other Christians? Because these other Christians weren't going to suffer what he was going to suffer. Folks, I took you through the beatings. I took you through the scourging. I took you through the crucifixion. I took you through all that. And I'll be honest with you. In my heart of hearts, I know that that's not what Jesus was sweating blood about. He was sweating blood. Because he understood that when the sin of the world would be upon him, 
then the wrath of his father would also be upon him. We walk around with such liberty in Christ. We, we, we do whatever we want to do. Oh, everything's admissible. It's okay. God loves you. There's grace on this. And we need to honor each other's choices and all these different things. But let me explain something to you. He saved you from the wrath. I've heard one preacher say it like this. Imagine a, a wall of water that's a thousand feet high and coming at you with a thousand miles an hour. There's just nothing you can do. You can't run backwards. You can't run to the side. You can't jump over it. It's coming. There's nothing that's going to stop it. And when it hits you, it's going to obliterate you. It's going to just wipe you out. That's the wrath of God that's coming on this earth. It's like I said, that nobody crucifies anymore. All of our crosses are jewelry, ornaments we hang on the tree. And we talk about how pretty they are. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Beloved, most of the world carries on with their selfish desires, their selfish course. They're unaware, and I guarantee you, even Christians are unappreciative of the sacrifice that Jesus did for them. How do I know that? Because they go on living any way they seem fit. They're just happy that they're going to heaven because they said a prayer. They live like the world and some like the devil all week long. And then they show up to church with their blood, blood red eyes. And they raise up hands and they say, I'm worshiping. My Bible says that we'll all give account of our lives one day. Our selfishness, our unappreciativeness, what we want. I hear people say, you know, well, God said he'll give me the desires of my heart. He said he will when your heart changes to his desires. Well, I don't want his desires. I want my desires. And that's what your problem is. Because his desires would make you more happy if you gave him a chance. He created you. You don't think he knows what would make you happy? Well, I want my own choice. I want to make my own decisions. Go ahead. And he'll make his decisions too when the time comes. It's the truth. Would you stand to your feet? Are there any questions? So everybody understands. Everybody pictures. Good. I, it bothers me when I see preachers try to clean it up and make it pretty. There was nothing pretty about the crucifixion. There was nothing beautiful about the crucifixion. There was nothing, you know, say, well, his love is beautiful. Yeah, I understand that part. But I'm talking about what he went through. There's just nothing. Nothing pretty or beautiful. Or quite honestly, there's nothing that justifies, you know, us hanging it on a tree. Or, you know, there's just nothing about it, folks. I think we need to give him more honor for what he's done. More respect. Because he didn't just give his life, which would be more than enough. He suffered. Imagine having a gun in your hand, able to defend yourself completely, and choosing the whole time to go through hours and hours of suffering 
not once raising the gun, not once threatening, but letting him do and mock you and hurt you and kill you. He could have stopped it at any time. He could have come off that cross completely whole in an instant. He didn't. He was obedient unto death. So I ask you tonight, church, what will be your response to this? What will be your response tonight? Will it be, well, I already gave my life to the Lord. Is that your response after seeing this again? Hearing this again, is that your response? Well, I, I you know, uh, I'm doing my best. Is that your response? Because the question is, in these last few minutes tonight, what is your response to the reminder of what God did for you? See, it's kind of like the soldier who runs and jumps on the grenade so the other soldiers don't die, right? It reminds me of another illustration. It reminds me of a, of a I don't know exactly what they call him. I'm going to call him a train master, a, somebody who runs the train tracks, looking and seeing that his son is playing on the tracks and seeing two trains coming in opposite directions. And as they're coming in opposite directions, he realizes that he made a mistake. And they're on the same track. And he has to make a decision. If he changes the track of one of the trains, he'll save all the passengers. The problem is his son is on the track that he needs to change it to. And there's no way to get the son out of the way. So at the last minute, he makes a decision. And all the passengers lived. But that means his son died so that the passengers could live. Beloved, God sent his only begotten son because you and I were on the train tracks. The oblivion is coming. Judgment and wrath is coming. And God put his son and said, I'm going to sacrifice my son that my creation might live. What is your response? What is your response? If you want to respond, I open up this altar to you right now. If you want to respond, however it is, we're just going to spend some time just responding to the cross. Then I open up this altar to you right now. That you would come and you would say thank you. That you would come and say, I need to recommit myself. That you would come and say, I don't, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. I want to be a disciple to serve him. It's up to you, church. What is your response? Hallelujah. Father, we come before you, Lord. We pray that you would remind us that Easter is uh, not about the eggs and the baskets and the candy. But it's about the sacrifice, Father. The sacrifice that you made of your only begotten Son, Lord. Help us to know. Help us to understand. Help us to become like you, Jesus. Holy Spirit.
Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Mold us and shape us. Mold us and shape us, Father. Beloved, the Lord, the, the Bible says that in the last days there'll be wars and rumors of wars. It says there'll be children that disrespect their parents, that brothers and sisters will be against each other, and brothers and, and fathers and uh, sons and fathers will be against each other, and that there'll be pestilence, and there'll be volcanoes and earthquakes, and there'll be all these horrible things. And if you take any time to look at the world with the media today, you see that there are nothing but horrible things out there. This is not a time to attend church twice a week. This is a time to become church. To be the church. In prayer. To be the church. In sacrifice. To be the church in the anointing. This is what it is. The Bible says that two thirds will fall away and one third, the remaining third, will go through the refiner's fire. And those he will call his own. Do you want to know why two-thirds fall away? Because they lack commitment. Because they don't want to be reminded of the cross. They don't want to be reminded of what he went through. They don't want to, oh, pastor, he's just trying to make us feel bad. No. I'm trying to let you see it for what it was. I've asked the Lord to take me back there to let me see it. I hope one day he does. I've heard of other ministers that he's done that to. Beloved, the central part of the gospel is that God incarnate came and died for your sins. And that three days later, he rose again. That's the central message of the gospel. It's not prospering you for houses and cars. It's not prospering you for some fancy, you know, whatever it is you want. It's not that you walk in and you're blessed and everything's perfect. That's not the central thing of the gospel. It's that he came and died and rose again. So I want to lead you in the prayer of salvation right now. I want all of us to recommit ourselves and maybe some of, you, some of you to give yourself for the first time. But I want to lead you in the prayer of salvation right now. To give you opportunity before you leave here tonight. To get your names written in the Lamb's book of life. And to start living for the one who died for you first. So say this with me, Father, I ask for forgiveness for all of my sins, those I've committed and those I still yet to commit. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for all of my sins. And I believe that three days later, you rose again, conquering death, hell, and the grave. Jesus, come into my life. Change me. Mold me. Shape me. In your name I pray. Amen. You can say the prayer but it must be with your heart. We call it stillborn births. Somebody said it because everybody else was saying it. It's not a birth. 
It's a stillborn, stillborn birth. It, nothing happened. I thank you for being here tonight. I thank you for allowing me to give you a, just a piece of what it was really like. But I got really good news for you. Sunday, it's not about the death. It's about the resurrection. We might live because he lives. We will rise because he rose. That's what Sunday's about. Come on Sunday. Invite somebody. We've got 12 or 13 water baptisms to do on Sunday. Maybe you want to join them. Bring a towel and a change of clothes. I mean, why not? We're going to have a picnic afterwards. There'll be food. There'll be eggs and baskets. But that's because we already know the truth, right? We can have the eggs. We can have the baskets. But I tell you what, what we're going to have the most of of Sunday, we're going to have Father's presence. That's what he told me. He's going to be here strong and mighty on Sunday. So come and bring people that are sick. Bring people that need to know Jesus. Bring, just bring whoever. Whoever wants to come. You know, it's funny. Something about Easter and Christmas, people suddenly, they come to church. Well, let's get them into the Father's presence. And then we'll let the Holy Spirit deal with it. Amen? Definitely.